Hello, I'm JJ Joaquin, and welcome to Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Today, we will talk about God and the problem of evil. Now, according to the so-called Anselmian thesis, if God exists, then this God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent. But the existence of God has been challenged by the existence of evil and suffering in the world. Since if God has all those omnipotent properties, then there should be no evil. Now, since evil exists, however, it seems to follow that there is no God. Now, according to our guest in this episode, the problem of evil is not only a problem for theists, it is also a problem even for atheists and non-theists. So here to guide us through the problem of evil uh, in the philosophy of religion, we have Professor Eugene Nagasawa. H.G. Wood Professor of the Philosophy of Religion at the University of Birmingham and the Director of the John W. Milton Global Philosophy of Religion Project. Hello, Professor Nagasau. Welcome to Philosophy and What Matters. Thank you for having me. Okay, so before we start uh, discussing our topic, let's first discuss your philosophical background. How did you get into philosophy? Okay, so when I was a um, teenager in Japan, I read an introductory philosophy book and I was really fascinated. And I particularly liked the first chapter of the book, uh, which discusses the concept of RK in uh, ancient Greek philosophy. So these ancient Greek philosophers, they tried to find out RK, the fundamental principle or element of reality. And I thought this was very interesting. And I thought I wanted to study philosophy, uh, but uh, my university, which was linked to my high school, didn't have a philosophy department. So instead I chose to study law because I thought if I study law, I can study jurisprudence, which is basically the philosophy of law. Mm -hmm. And then I went to this university and then I met an interesting professor of jurisprudence. And um, this professor had a big grant from the Japanese government. And he was working on, um, on a uh, legal expert system, which is basically artificial intelligence, uh, intelligence, which simulate um, or emulate uh, lawyers' uh, decision-making abilities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is um, uh, old time. Uh, he was, you know, this, is, this was before Windows. So he was using MS-DOS 5.0 <laughs> and the programming language called the Prologue. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, he was a little bit ahead of time, but he was an unusual professor. And he said, I should study logic, mathematics, and analytic philosophy. And I thought this was funny because I was prepared to study law, but I was told to study mathematics. <laughs> and then eventually I thought, I thought that I, you know, I really want to study philosophy and mathematics seriously. So I moved to the States uh, and uh, I went to uh, the State University of New York at Stony Brook to study philosophy and applied mathematics. Mm -hmm. And there I met some interesting professors as well. So this department, in this uh, philosophy department there, there were you know, very interesting analytic philosophers like Peter Ladlow, Patrick Grimm, and Gary Marr. So for example, uh, Patrick Grimm, uh, he is a logician, mm -hmm. uh, but at, the, at that time he was working on computer modeling of philosophical puzzles and paradoxes. And also he wrote a very interesting book called The Incomplete Universe, where he argues that um, the concept of omniscience is uh, somewhat incoherent because mm -hmm. we cannot achieve omniscience because we face all sorts of, all sorts of puzzles concerning uh, uh, our limitations of knowledge. And there was also Gary Marr, who is a logician, and uh, he is also a philosopher of religion. So he wrote an interesting paper on the model unity of Anselm's ontological argument for the existence of God. Mm -hmm. And Ladlow is a philosopher of language and linguistics, and he taught several, um, you know, all sorts of interesting uh, courses in, this, uh, in these areas. So, you know, I met these really inspiring teachers there, and I thought, you know, this is philosophy is really something that I want to study more. And that, that was the beginning of my uh, journey in philosophy. Now that's interesting because Patrick Graham, as we all know, has that little article, "The Problems of Omniscience." Mm -hmm. Were you influenced by that? Well, were you influenced mm -hmm. by that 
by that article? Yeah, at that time, I didn't really think about it. I, mm -hmm. you know, my interest was in the philosophy of language and philosophy of mind. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really think that I would work on uh, omniscience, <laughs> but, uh, you know, later, you know, I, you know, I have, I have written several papers on omniscience and probably there was some uh, uh, unconscious influence of Patrick Grimm. So aside from Peter Laudler, Moore and Grimm, who else influenced you to pursue an academic career in philosophy? Okay, so after my undergraduate studies, I went to Australia mm -hmm. uh, to do a PhD in philosophy. And that was the year 2000. And um, in 1996, uh, Dave Chalmers published the influential uh, seminal uh, book called The Conscious Mind. And this is where he introduced the notion of the hard problem of consciousness. Mm -hmm. so, you know, consciousness, you know, what it is like to feel pain, what it is like to feel pleasure and so on. They seem to be very different from ordinary physical objects and properties. So Chalmers said that, you know, the, the hardest problem uh, in, um, in philosophy is to find out, you know, where we can place these uh, unusual phenomenal properties in, in our universe, which seems to be um, fundamentally uh, material. And everyone was excited about his book, and I was one of them. So <laughs> around that time, everyone wanted to do a PhD in philosophy of mind, and I was one of them. <clears throat> and I wanted to work with Frank Jackson, who is also a philosopher of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I particularly liked his knowledge argument against the physicalist approach to consciousness. So I went to the Australian National University to work with Frank. Mm -hmm. And uh, there I also encountered, I met uh, Daniel Stojar. Uh, yeah, whom, yeah. I'm aware that you interviewed him. <laughs> and I still remember our first meetings. I had some ideas about externalism and self-knowledge, which I was working on at the time. And I presented my idea mm -hmm. and uh, he, immediately grasped my argument. I wrote, wrote it down on a whiteboard and you know, analyzed it and he suggested, you know, make, maybe you can tweak some of these premises and you can derive a much more interesting conclusion. I was like, oh, wow, how can he <laughs> grasp my idea so fast and analyze it and even, you know, he can suggest a, a way to improve it. And I thought, you know, he could see something that I cannot see. And I thought I went to, wanted to become like him. But I think, you know, I really admire philosophers like Daniel, who is a clear thinker and a clear writer as well. So philosophers that have influenced me, they're all clear thinkers and clear writers, I think. So people like Alvin Plantinga, mm -hmm. uh, Frank Jackson, Daniel Stojar, and these people, Dave Chalmers as well. Okay. And that, um, that, I, hmm. Yeah, that's a, a unusual route. So you're coming from law, jurisprudence, mm -hmm. then philosophy of mm -hmm. law, then language, then a bit of philosophy of religion. Then you went to the ANU with philosophy of mind coming mm -hmm. into the picture. But most of your work has focused on philosophy of religion. So how did you end up mm -hmm. in this area of philosophy? Mm -hmm. So I, I was always interested in philosophy of religion because I like to talk about the existence of God and the origin of the universe and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, so my main interest at the beginning was in the philosophy of mind. And so my PhD thesis was mainly on Frank Jackson's knowledge argument. So this argument goes something like this. So he says, you know, the argument is based on a thought experiment. So imagine Mary, a brilliant scientist who lives in a black and white environment. And she has, she, acqu she has acquired complete physical knowledge by reading black and white textbooks and black and, uh, watching black and white television. You know, everything there is to know about the physical. But one day she comes outside her room for the first time and she sees color. And then she, you know, discovers something. She would say, wow, this is what it is like to see color. Mm -hmm. And Jackson says that, you know, this is a refutation of physicalism because she knew everything there is to know in the physical world, but she still discovered something, which means that there is something beyond the physical. And uh, so, the, you know, this was the topic of my PhD thesis. But then I realized that, you know, many people describe Mary in this thought experiment as a physically omniscient scientist. Mm 
And I thought that was very interesting. And I thought, okay, maybe I can have a look at the literature uh, on omniscience in the philosophy of religion. Mm -hmm. And of course, there was, you know, Patrick Grimm's uh, work on omniscience too. And uh, I found some interesting arguments in the philosophy of religion that are somewhat comparable to Jackson's argument. So some philosophers of religion talk about, you know, whether or not God can know what it is like to be in danger or what it is like to feel pain, given that God is all powerful and, and so on. Mm. So I try to contrast these arguments in the philosophy of religion and and the philosophy of mind and then try to find you know what we can learn from this comparison that, that, that was my phd thesis and that that's how i started to work very seriously uh, on philosophy of religion and these days i tend to be too busy with philosophy of religion so i <laughs> have worked on all sorts of topics like the problem of evil the 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 existence and nature of god miracles and so on uh, but I still have research interest in the philosophy of mind, especially uh, the problem of consciousness, which still fascinates me. So I still work in these two areas, but yeah, you're right that my main uh, area of uh, research interest these days is the philosophy of religion. Now, let's turn to the main topic in the philosophy of religion. One of the main topics is the problem of evil. One important contribution you made in this area of philosophy is your elaboration of the Anselmian thesis. You have a book on this one as well. Mm -hmm. But could you elaborate or could you tell us something about these, this, these particular thesis? Okay, so the Anselmian thesis says that God is something than which no greater can be thought. So God is that than which no greater can be thought. That's what Anselm says in his book called the Proslogion, which was published in the 11th century. Uh, but recently, I don't call it the Anselmian thesis. I call it the perfect being thesis, because mm -hmm. often Anselm scholars, they say, you know, you're not being faithful to Anselm's <laughs> text, or <laughs> your view doesn't really represent Anselm's metaphysics. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to say, you know, I... This is just a thesis that is inspired by Anselm. And I don't necessarily mean to defend Anselm's entire metaphysical system. But anyway, I thought it's safe to say, uh, call, call this thesis the, uh, the perfect being thesis rather than the Anselmian thesis. But yeah. anyway, so according to this thesis, uh, there is nothing uh, greater than God. God is the greatest possible being, if we rephrase this thesis in a more contemporary way. So there is no possible being that is greater than God. So if your God, uh, if there is something greater than your God, then your God is not, not the God according to the perfect being thesis. Mm -hmm. And I would say, you know, this thesis is accepted by most Judeo-Christian Islamic theists. Uh, they would all, all agree that there is no possible being that is greater than God. So I think this is a very good definition that captures the, the, the nature of God. But the perfection here implies omnipotence, omniscience, and omnibenevolence? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. I, I think it's, um, <clears throat> it's a quite contentious topic. I think philosophers tend to assume that you know, if God is the greatest possible being, then he or she or it must be omniscient, omnipotent, omnibenevolence, because knowledge, power, and benevolence are great making properties, properties that make its possessor great. God should have all of these properties to the highest degree uh, of uh, intensity. Uh, but uh, that's something I dispute in my book, Maximum God. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in your A New Defense of the Anselmian the Theism, you outline three sorts of problems against the thesis. And you claim that there must be a holistic solution to these mm -hmm. problems. So can you elaborate on this one? So what are the three sorts of problems against the Anselmian or the perfect being thesis? Okay, so there are many, many arguments against the existence of God. But first I say, okay, all of them can be classified into three different types. So type A arguments uh, mm -hmm. focus on one of God's omni attributes. So for example, um, the paradox of the stone focuses on God's omnipotence. And it goes something like this. Either God can create a stone that he cannot lift, or God cannot create a stone that he cannot lift. But you know, in either way, God is not omnipotent. So there is always something that God cannot do. Mm. 
or there is always some, you know, there's no being that can do everything. So this paradox, if it's sound, it shows that the concept of omnipotence is internally incoherent. So type A arguments are like this. So they try to focus on one of God's omni attributes and try to show that there cannot be an omni God because uh, at least one of these omni attributes is internally incoherent or self-contradictory. Mm -hmm. And there are several other arguments that try to show that God's uh, omnibenevolence is uh, self-contradictory or omniscience is self-contradictory. Type B arguments, as I call them, try to show that some of these omni attributes are mutually incompatible. Mm -hmm. So for example, what I call the argument from God's inability to sin says that okay, if God is all powerful or omnipotent, then he should be able to do absolutely everything, <laughs> including torturing innocent children, for example. But if God is omnibenevolent or all loving, then God shouldn't be able to torture innocent children because that's a horrible thing to do. So this argument seems to suggest that omnibenevolence and omnipotence are mutually incompatible. So God or no being can have both of them at the same time. So therefore, if we define God as an uh, omnipotent and omnibenevolent being, then God doesn't exist. <laughs> and there are other similar arguments, type of B arguments, that try to show that God's omni omniscience and omnibenevolence are incompatible, or omnibenevolence and omniscience and om omnipotence are incompatible, mm. and so on. <clears throat> type C arguments try to show that there is some external fact which is incompatible with the set of Omni attributes. And probably the most well known example is the problem of evil. Mm. So this problem says that okay, there is the fact that evil exists. So in this world, there are horrible things like wars and crimes and natural disasters and so on. And the fact that they exist is incompatible with the set of God's uh, omni attributes omniscience, omnipotence, and omnibenevolence. Because if God is omniscient, then he should know that there is evil. Mm -hmm. If God is omnipotent, then he should be able to eradicate evil. And if God is omnibenevolent, then he should be willing to eradicate evil. But there is evil. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we have to give up at least one of these omni attributes. And uh, there are several other arguments like this, including the problem of um, divine hiddenness and um, uh, the argument from no best possible world and so on. Mm -hmm. And I say that, you know, if we look at these arguments, all of them focus on God's omni attributes. Uh, and that's because, again, theists tend to say that you know, once we accept the perfect being thesis or the Anselmian thesis, uh, then we have to uh, agree that God is an omniscient, omnipotent, omnibenevolent being because the greatest possible being should be omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent. Mm -hmm. But I say that, that that's not really obvious. Maybe the paradox of the stone is right. Maybe omnipotence is a self-contradictory concept. Then, you know, what theists can say is that, okay, God is still the greatest possible being, as the perfect being uh, thesis says. Uh, but nevertheless, God is not an omnipotent being, because no being can be omnipotent, because omnipotence is a self-contradictory concept. So these theists can say, still say that, you know, God has the maximal consistent set of knowledge, power, and benevolence. And that's what I call the maximal God thesis. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily that God is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent, but God has the maximal consistent set of these attributes, knowledge, power, and benevolence. And in this way, we can undercut all of these arguments at once. So what we can say is that, Okay, maybe the paradox of the stone is right. Maybe no being is omnipotent. But then in that case, God is you know, very, very powerful, but not exactly omnipotent because no being is omnipotent. Mm -hmm. And um, in this way, I think this is a, an economical uh, response to these arguments against the existence of God. Because you know, existing uh, uh, response to these arguments is to assess every single argument against the existence of God. So every time a, an atheist comes up with a new argument, then we just have to analyze it and specify exactly what is wrong with the argument. But if we have this economical uh, maximal God approach, then we can undercut all of these arguments at once. So that's, that's my 
general approach to these arguments. No, that's interesting because I'm hearing Alvin planting his notion of a maximal God here. Mm -hmm. Did he influence you in this argument? Yeah, planting when he presents the ontological argument, the modal ontological argument, he, uh, I think he says that God is a maximal being, maximally great being. Mm. Um, I did a, yeah, I, I wasn't really aware of it. Maybe you're right that uh, planting is one of these early figures who defined God as a, as a maximally great being. Uh, maybe there is some influence there. Yeah, but you, the maximality here does not imply omnipotence in, in our... Exactly, yeah. yeah. So planting, I think he still assumed that even though he defined God as a maximally great being in his presentation of the modal ontological argument, he still assumed that maximal means necessarily omniscient, necessarily omnipotent, mm. necessarily omnibenevolent. Mm. And I, I'm, I don't reject that idea. I'm, I'm not saying that God is definitely not omnipotent or <laughs> definitely not omnibenevolent. And so I'm just saying that, you know, the should be open. You know, they, they don't necessarily need to say, you know, God is absolutely omnipotent and omniscient and omnibenevolent. They can say that God has a maximal consistent set of these attributes. And whether that means that God is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent is a further question. They don't need to make any commitment, but they say they tend to say too much. <laughs> they say that God is a maximal being, and moreover, he is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent. And that's why they have to face these arguments. Actually, I'm thinking about maximality in terms of ideal property. So God must be an ideal, powerful being or an ideal, uh, knowledgeable being and so on. Mm -hmm. Not really having that kind of you know, the, the omni of the extreme of the sense, because right. you'll have the contradictions uh, right. along the way. So I think the maximality uh, thesis, your maximality mm -hmm. thesis is spectacular. <laughs> So. <laughs> yeah, it's a one. Yeah, I, I like the your notion of um, God as an I ideal being because mm. I think that's underlying in the Anselmian or perfect being thesis. So, mm. so God is the greatest possible being in the sense that there is no being that is, that is greater than God, even in, uh, even conceptually. So in mm. that sense, God is the most ideal being, mm. and. You know exactly what kind of properties this ideal being has is a you know a further question that philosophers can address. But the theists don't necessarily need to say you know God has definitely these properties. Okay, let's move on to the one of your contributions in the philosophy of religion as well, the problem of evil. So you mentioned about the problem of evil as type C, a type C argument against the existence of God. And could you tell us something about this problem and some theistic solutions for it? Okay, so here's my rough understanding of the history of the debate on the problem of evil uh, in analytic philosophy. So in 1955, uh, J.L. Mackey uh, published a paper called Evil and Omnipotence in, in the journal Mind. Mm -hmm. And then there he basically said that the existence of evil in the world is logically incompatible with the existence of God. So given that there is evil in this world, there cannot be God, logically speaking. Mm. Evil and God are logically incompatible. And this is a pretty strong claim. And Plantinga said in the 70s, I believe, he said that you know he can show that evil and God are not logically incompatible or inconsistent because there is a logically possible scenario where God and evil coexist. Mm -hmm. And then he said, very roughly speaking, he said, okay, God had to create free human agents like us because freedom is intrinsically great. But because we are free and moreover, we are morally significantly free. Sometimes we do good things, but sometimes we do bad things, but God is not responsible for that. And he said, he didn't say that, you know, this is what actually happened, but he says, this is at least a logically possible scenario where God and evil coexist. Um, and um, it shows that, uh, that Mackey's claim is false. It's not true that um, evil and God are logically incompatible. And then uh, that's why uh, atheists these days tend to talk about the evidential problem of evil, which is a weaker version of the problem of evil. So they say that, okay, maybe evil and God are not logically incompatible, 
but nevertheless, evil is very strong evidence against the existence of God. Mm -hmm. So here's my analogy. So suppose that you have a fancy car and it's a very rare car and with a unique scratch. And then one day your car gets stolen. And then, uh, you know, I, I drive a car that is very similar to yours, including this unique scratch. And then some of your friends tell you that, uh, you know, they, they saw me around your house when the car was stolen. And then, you know, this is pretty good evidence that I stole your car. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, it's logically possible that I, I didn't. Uh, but maybe that's not important because this is still very strong evidence that I stole your car. And, it, you know, the situation is a little bit similar. Evil might not logically undermine the existence of God, but it's still very strong evidence against the existence of God. And uh, of course, theists have introduced many responses to the evidential problem of evil. So for example, the um, whole making theodicy says that, okay, God had to allow evil because evil is necessary for our spiritual maturity. So in order for us to uh, improve spiritually, uh, we have to encounter a certain amount of evil. Or the greater good theodicy says that God has had to allow evil because uh, in order to realize certain greater goods like compassion and altruism and so on, there has to be evil. Uh, and um, skeptical theism, which is one of the most uh, popular responses to the problem of evil, says that, okay, probably God has very good reason to allow evil, but we just don't know what it is you know <laughs> our knowledge is very limited there are a lot of things that we don't know about morality and the nature of god uh, so it's reasonable to assume that uh, we don't have relevant uh, knowledge here but that doesn't mean that god doesn't have any good reason if there is god as a an all-powerful all-knowing and all good uh, being then uh, god must have a very good reason to allow evil but we just don't know it so it's a version of skepticism so, uh, so th these are some of the um, prominent responses to the problem of evil discussed in the literature today. Yeah, but that's interesting because J.L. Mackey in his Evil on the, in Omnipotence article has already discussed and, well, responded to these uh, mm. theistic solutions, which he mm. calls fallacious solutions. I wonder how, how mm. you would react to, Mackey, to Mackey's argument. To be honest, I don't remember exactly what Mackey says in that paper, apart from his presentation of the logical problem of evil. But mm -hmm. probably the, the way I outline the history of the philosophy of religion is a little bit too simplistic because yeah, obviously Mackey was aware of these theistic responses and he, mm -hmm. he addresses these responses. And um, he would, yeah, I'm sure he would say that the, none of these responses is um, successful in undermining the problem of evil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if you have the notion of omnipotence, then the necessary good from evil argument won't work because, well, if God is omnipotent, then he could. Uh, it's not necessary for him to have evil, to have, for us to have the good and so on. I think that's the mm -hmm. main line of the argument. But yeah. one, yeah, one intriguing philosophical claim that you made is that the problem of evil is not only a problem for theists, but also for atheists and non-theists. So what's your argument for this claim? Right. So that's an unusual claim that I yes, make it is. <laughs> in one of my papers uh, titled the, the problem of evil for atheists. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, again, the problem of evil is normally presented as a challenge for a theist. So actually, atheists use this argument to undermine theism. Mm -hmm. But I say there is a version of the problem of evil which creates challenge, not only for theists, but also for atheists, or at least a certain group of atheists. <clears throat> so my argument goes something like this. So first, I focus on a specific type of the problem of evil. So I focus on pain and suffering uh, arises in the process of natural selection. Mm -hmm. So nature uh, seems to be a quite uh, violent and cruel place. And our existence as um, sentient animals uh, uh, is dependent on natural selection. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why you know, the 
animals, sentient animals and humans like us, we have to compete for survival all the time. And that's why uh, there's a lot of uh, pain and suffering in nature and that's inevitable. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is what I call the, the systemic problem of evil. So I'm not talking about any specific events or specific types of events. I'm not talking about you know, natural disasters or wars and so on. I'm talking about the system which seems to be evil or system that seems to uh, necessitate pain and suffering. And um, okay, so this, is, this clearly cre creates a challenge for theists because theists would say that you know, God created the world. Mm -hmm. And so obviously God is responsible for natural selection. So how could God do that? Uh, but also I focus on atheists who embrace what I call existential optimism mm -hmm. in the idea that, you know, the nature is overall a wonderful thing and we should be grateful that we live in it. In it. So for example, Richard Dawkins, he's a very powerful atheist, but he's also a, an existential optimist. Mm -hmm. But he says, you know, we should be grateful for natural selection, which allows us to exist. And thanks to natural selection, uh, we can appreciate the beauty of nature. And then I say, you know, there is some uh, uh, conflict between existential optimism and the affirmation that nature is based on our existence is uh, dependent on natural selection. Because on the one hand, uh, existential optimists would want to say that you know, we, the nature is overall great and we should be grateful to be alive. But at the same time, our existence is causally or nomologically dependent on this you know, pain and suffering for millions of billions of uh, sentient animals. Mm -hmm. so how can we consistently hold these two beliefs at the same time? And I raise this problem because I, I I think that the problem of evil is a specific type of uh, bigger problem, which I call the problem of axiological mismatch or problem of ex ex expectation mismatch. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that you project a certain level of um, axiological value to the world. So for, for instance, theists, they think that okay, the, the world was created by God and God is all loving and all powerful. So the world should be you know, very, very good. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the world, there are a lot of horrible things. So it looks like there is a gap between your expectation and reality. And this gap creates the problem of evil. Mm -hmm. And here, atheists seem to be facing a similar problem. So existential, atheists who are existential optimists, they want to think that the world is overall really good. But if you look at the reality of the world carefully, then it looks like a quite a horrible place where pain and suffering for many, many sentient animals and humans are uh, guaranteed. So they have to explain this gap. Mm -hmm. So this is a version of the problem of evil, which creates a challenge not only for theists, but also for atheists. Atheists of the existential optimist sort. That's right, yeah. <laughs> not, not all atheists. I, I tend to think that the pessimists they are consistent. It's very easy to say, okay, the world is horrible. We just accept that. We Full are stop. atheists. And, yeah. <laughs> I think that's a consistent and very straightforward view. Mm -hmm. But uh, there are very, uh, I would say, you know, many or even most atheists are optimists as well. They tend to say, you know, life is overall great and mm -hmm. overall it's great that we are alive and, and so on. And this problem creates of a, you know, challenge for them. No, it's interesting that you're talking about gaps, uh, axiological value gaps. I wonder how Frank Jackson reacted to this because there's a similarity in the epistemic gap argument as well. Okay, I, I didn't even think about it. I have to, I have to think about it. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about that connection that there's a gap between physical knowledge and uh, phenomenological knowledge that we have. Right. At the same time, we have that kind of expect, expectation of the goodness in the world, but there's a the reality yeah, that's, of yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that, that's that's interesting maybe that's another unconscious um influence, influence. That have. <laughs> yeah so in jackson's knowledge argument he derives an ontological conclusion that physicalism is false mm -hmm. from the epistemic gap between mary's uh, complete physical knowledge and complete knowledge simpliciter right and this gap you know, tell, tells us something interesting. Maybe I might be doing something similar here. I, I didn't even think about that. That's, <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, 
uh, that's an intriguing problem. And I think one of the inspirations in the global philosophy of religion project that you are now heading. So this is a, a John Templeton grant that you have received you know, a couple of years ago or last year. So could you tell us something about this project and what results are expected from it? Yeah, so this is a three year project funded by the John Templeton Foundation and our university. And um, so again, I, I love philosophy of religion because in this area of philosophy, we address all sorts of big questions about the existence of God, the sports of morality, uh, science and religion and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think there has been a lot of exciting um, uh, development in philosophy of religion uh, in the last 30, 40 years. Uh, but I have to say the scope of the philosophy of religion has been quite narrow. Mm. Uh, so the main focus has been on Judeo-Christian monotheism. And I think that's partly because uh, most uh, philosophers of religion in the English speaking part of the world are uh, Christians. And I think th there is nothing wrong about that. I think Christian philosophers have made you know, significant contributions to, to this field. And there have been you know, amazing work uh, in Christian philosophy. But if we uh, take religion seriously, we cannot ignore other traditions as well. So, you know, Islam, Judaism, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, and so on. Mm -hmm. So I want to expand the scope of this um, field uh, because there are a lot of amazing philosophical and religious resources in each tradition, uh, which have been discussed for centuries. So uh, I want to expand the scope in terms of religious traditions that we cover. And also we want to, um, <clears throat> through this project, we want to expand the scope of the field in terms of geographical locations as well. Mm -hmm. So we would like to promote research by philosophers of religion in underrepresented regions, such as Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East. Mm -hmm. So I know that you're from the Philippines, so we really welcome <clears throat> contributions from philosophers in uh, Southeast Asia. And I think this is quite exciting. I'm sure it will be a slow process. It's, it will be a long process. Mm. Um, but uh, we want to uh, you know, promote research in this field by inviting you know, all philosophers of religion from all religious and even non-religious traditions from, uh, uh, you know, from all over the world. So that, that's what we try to do uh, in the next three years. OK, so where do you see philosophy of religion heading in the future? So um, I would say, so philosophy of religion uh, has been quite interesting in the last uh, few years. There have been some new emerging topics. So for example, uh, religious uh, disagreement or uh, the cognitive science of religion. So there have been some uh, interesting uh, developments in the cognitive science of religion. Mm -hmm. uh, which have implications for philosophy of religion. And also there has been some uh, recent work on alternative concepts of God, which I have worked on, on as well. So you know, we explore alternatives to uh, the traditional Judeo-Christian monotheistic concept of God, like pantheism, panentheism, uh, polytheism, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say in the end, we will still be mainly talking about some of the old questions in the field, like the existence and nature of God and other deities, the possibility of immortality and the afterlife, mm -hmm. faith and knowledge, um, and again, science and religion, miracles and so on. So I think these uh, questions and problems will remain, but hopefully uh, from more global perspectives, because I think globalization is inevitable whether whether or not you like it i think the world is being globalized and i think this field has to follow that as well so hopefully you know there'll be a lot of interesting uh, global uh, inter uh, faith and interreligious uh, discussions on these topics in, in the coming years okay so on a more personal note now you've been uh, one of the best philosophers of religion that we have around presently. So what's your advice for those who want to get into professional philosophy? So I would say to young people, whether or not they do philosophy, I would tell them to do something that they really 
enjoy. I think there is nothing more painful than doing something that they, they don't enjoy. Uh, so in the debate on the meaning of life, we talk uh, often talk about Sisyphus. Sisyphus is this um, mythological character who has to push this heavy rock every day towards the top of the mountain. And as soon as he reaches the top, then this rock rolls down on the other side of the mountain. He has to push this rock. <laughs> so this is a paradigm example of uh, of pain, painful and meaningless life. And you know we all <laughs> we wouldn't want to have a life like this. Um, so I say you know find something that you really enjoy. And if you love philosophy, then I would say, you know, pursue an academic career in philosophy um, because that's the most uh, intellectually rewarding thing. And there's not, you know, the, money is obviously important. You have to feed yourself, but there are a lot of things that are more important than money. So if you <laughs> love philosophy, I mean, you cannot make a lot of money in philosophy, but if you love the subject, you know, there is nothing more rewarding than pursuing an academic career in philosophy. Yeah, so is a career in philosophy worth it? Would you say that your career is worth it? Yeah, I would say my answer is yes or no. If you love philosophy like myself, you know, this is a great career. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy every moment. Uh, I think it's amazing that I can make a living from teaching philosophy to some of the you know, bright young uh, students. And also I can, you know, publish my work and many people around the world would read my work and send me feedback. Mm -hmm. Or I can give talks to people in many different countries. Uh, I have given lectures in over 20 countries and I don't know if I could have done it without uh, being in this uh, profession. So I feel very fortunate and uh, I, I, I love it uh, all the time. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it's a very competitive field. Mm -hmm. And also you might think that academic philosophers can philosophize all the time, but we also, you know, have all sorts of boring things <laughs> in our <laughs> jobs. So we have to attend many committee meetings and uh, uh, there's a lot of paperwork and we always uh, have a pile of uh, essays to grade. And, you know, it's, it's not <laughs> that uh, exciting. But uh, nevertheless, you know, I, I, I do enjoy it because I, I enjoy philosophy. Okay, so on that note, thanks again, Professor Nagazawa, for sharing your time with us. For you guys, Thank join you. me again for another episode of Philosophy at One Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Cheers. <laughs>